AQA, A level physics, mechanics, uh, and I've got some multi choice questions here, uh, which you can have a go at, and then I'll go through the answers. So basically, for each question, pen, paper, calculator, uh, get it done, work it out, get an answer. Then, when you've done them all, I'll talk through each one and hopefully uh, explain it, and you'll pick up one or two tips and tricks and things, and we'll see how it goes anyway. So I'm going to stay on each question for about three seconds, so you've got time to pause and uh, get it done. Here we go. Okay, first question. <clears throat> These two wires, X and Y, and Y is thicker than X, uh, which of the following is correct? If you read through them, there's, there's one that stands out to me as obviously true, and that is C. I mean, the tension in Y is the same as the tension in X. Uh, this is ignoring the actual weight of the wires, which I think we can. Uh, all of the others, if you go through them, are rubbish. But basically, they're in series, they're supporting the same load, the tension is the same in both wires. Nice easy one to start with. Uh, two forces of 6 and 10, which of the following could not be the magnitude of the resultant? Well, the biggest that the magnitude could be is if you had the 10 and the 6 in the same direction, then it would be 16. The smallest it could be is if you had the 10 and the 6 in opposite direction. Uh, and if that was the case, then the resultant would be 4. So basically, it can't be less than 4. So D is rubbish. So that's the answer. Uh, this one here, car wheel nuts. So in the first case, we just have a, a clockwise moment, which is 200 times uh, 8, which I believe is 160. Uh, and the second diagram, we have a couple. And a couple is two equal and opposite forces uh, producing a turning force and the moment of the couple is 500 times this distance L so 500 L 500 times L equals uh, 160 so L is 0.32 uh, ball bearing of mass 2m projected vertically right so for X uh, our ball bearing is going upwards there and it's got a mass of 2m and its velocity upwards is u. Okay, now y uh, is projected at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal. So there's 30 degrees and its mass uh, is just m, but its velocity is 2u. Okay, so which of the following statements is correct? Uh, the horizontal component of y's velocity is u. No, it isn't, because it's 20 cos 30, and cos 30 is root 3 over 2, so that's rubbish. Uh, the maximum height reached by y is half of that reached by x. No, because the maximum height uh, is depends on the vertical component, and the vertical component, let's go blue, the vertical component here is 20 sine 30. Sine 30 is a half. So the vertical component is u, so they have the same vertical component. 
they will reach the same maximum height. Uh, X and Y reach the ground at the same time. Yes, because they'll go up with the same vertical velocity. They'll take the same amount of time. C is correct. Uh, and D is rubbish for that reason. So the answer is C. Uh, what is the relationship between distance Y falling freely and the time? OK, so we know our equations of motion really well. And so if I write down, well, S equals UT plus a half AT squared. If I write S equals a half GT squared, because the acceleration is G and U is zero, that's what we're talking about. So X is proportional to T squared, or Y, well, y is proportional to X squared, isn't it? The answer is A. Uh, car exerts a do da do da. Okay, so knowing your equations, power equals force times velocity, isn't it? Yes. Uh, we know the force, the resultant force. Uh, we know the velocity. You need to change that to meters per second. So times a thousand divided by three thousand six hundred. Uh, that's the power times the number of seconds in five minutes. And if you do all that, you should get a. Uh, this is a, a tricky one, this one. Okay, so before and after you cut the string. Well, uh, one thing is, when you cut the string, the two kilogram mass is just going to fall due to gravity. So B bites the dust straight away. Okay, it's not going to fall with an acceleration 2G. So it's A, C or D. Now, um, what's the one kilogram mass do? Well, what's the force acting on it? When it's in equilibrium, you've got um, 2mg downwards, 2mg due to that one there, and you've got 1mg due to its own weight. So when it's in equilibrium, you've got 3mg is the tension in the spring. So the tension in the spring is 3mg. So when we cut the string, when the string is cut, the resultant force on it will be 2mg, because it will be 3mg minus 1mg. So you'll have 2mg upwards. So its acceleration will be 2g. So the answer is C. Uh, object falls freely from rest. What is this velocity? Da, 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 da. Again, equations of motion. V squared minus u squared equals 2as. So V squared, u is 0. V squared equals 2a, in this case, d. Yeah, they're calling it d. So basically, V squared is proportional to d, or V is proportional to the square root of d. So if d is twice as big, then V will be root 2 times V, so the answer is d. Uh, electric motor input power do da. What's the output power? Well, the output power is mgh. Now, mgh, where h is 0 0.5 meters per second, and that's why it's power, because it's per second. Uh, if you work out mgh, then you get 49. So the efficiency is 49 over 100 which is the closest one there, is 50%. If you took G as 10, it would be 50%. So the answer is C. Uh, this one here, velocity of a vehicle shown by the graph, uh, which is force against time. Well, force is proportional to acceleration, and acceleration is the gradient of the graph. So looking at the gradient of a velocity time graph, so the gradient starts at zero, then the gradient gets bigger, uh, and then the gradient starts getting smaller, and then the gradient is zero again. So the, the force gets bigger, then the force gets smaller, and then it's zero again, so the answer's A. Uh, this one here, which is in equilibrium? Now, to be in equilibrium, the forces have to balance, and the moments have to balance about any point. So if we look at the forces first, on the first diagram, we've got 10 newtons downwards and we've got 10 newtons upwards. So that's OK. Second diagram, we've got 8 newtons downwards and we've got 10 newtons upwards. So no, that's rubbish. 
Uh, the third diagram, we've got eight down and we've got eight up, so that's okay. Uh, the fourth one, we've got uh, 12 down and we've got eight up, so that's rubbish. Okay, so it's either A or C. Now, if we look at the moments, so if we take moments about this point here, so on the first one, clockwise and anti-clockwise, let's call all of the distances one. Yeah, imagine it's like one meter. Uh, so on the first one, clockwise, we've got eight times one, which is eight. Anti-clockwise, we've got four times one, which is four, plus two times two, which is four. So anti-clockwise, we've got eight as well, eight Newton meters. So that's looking like the answer. Let's just check C. So clockwise, we've got two times one. So we've got two uh, plus four times two is eight. So we've got 10 Newton meters clockwise. Uh, Anti-clockwise, we've got two times one is two plus two times two is four. We've got six. So that's not going to be an equilibrium. So the answer is A. Uh, which row uh, provides the same information? Well, let's have a look. Gradient of a displacement time graph is velocity. Area under a, a velocity time graph is displacement. Uh, gradient of a displacement time graph is velocity. Area under an acceleration time graph will also be velocity. If, if uh, acceleration is dv dt, then a is the integral of um, V, uh, no, V is the integral of A with respect to time, so it's the area. Uh, gradient of a velocity time graph is acceleration. Uh, area under a displacement time graph is nothing. It doesn't mean anything. Gradient of a velocity time graph is acceleration. Area under an acceleration time graph would be velocity. The answer is B. Uh, rocket of mass doodah. Now, it is important that you get this one in your head because it's a very common question. And the trick is that F equals MA, but F is the resultant force. You've got the thrust upwards, yeah? The thrust is upwards, which is T, but then you've got MG downwards, the weight of the rocket, okay? Uh, and then the acceleration, well, basically you've got, it's accelerating upwards there. So that's um, A there. So it's T minus MG equals ma and what people students very often do if they're not used to it is to forget to take away the mg because it's the resultant force and if you bung in all the numbers you'll get c um, this one here is a lot of work we need to find the range how far it goes and the trick is to work out the time of flight if we know the time of flight to do that <coughs> we'll use the vertical component now, the vertical component of the velocity is 25 uh, sine 42. And that will tell us if we do um, V equals U plus AT, that will tell us the time it takes to get to the maximum height. And then what we do is we double it because the time it takes to get up is the same as the time it takes to get down. So you use V equals U plus AT to get the time to reach its maximum height and then you double it and that tells you the time of flight uh, then when you know the time of flight then horizontally uh, the distance is just velocity times time where the velocity is the horizontal component which is 25 cos 42 a uh, lot of work for one mark this one uh, the answer is d uh, this one here is um, conservation of momentum so before and after the momentum is the same. So we've got our car here and velocity V and it bangs into this lorry, this van, which isn't moving. Then after the collision, after the collision, uh, there's the car kind of bounces off a bit and the, the lorry, the, the van goes that way. Now we are told enough information to, to get the total momentum after. We know all the masses, we know all the velocities, and the total momentum after is the same as the total momentum before. 
So uh, be careful because the, the momentum of the, the car after is negative. Okay, so get the total momentum after, divide by the mass of the car, and you should get 11.2. Um, this one here is the kind of one where I look at it and I just recognize it. I mean, a bouncing ball. The ball is doing bouncy, 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 bouncy like that. Uh, what's happening to the velocity of the ball? Well, if we take downwards as positive, uh, in fact, what I've just done there, it's, it's dropped. So, oh, start again. Right, my ball is doing bouncy, 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 bouncy like that. So the velocity is like uh, positive, then negative, then positive, then negative, then positive, then negative. Having said that, the only one that does that is B. And then when the ball is actually in the air, its acceleration is just due to gravity. So apart from when it bounces, which is that there, this very short time when it's actually bouncing, its acceleration, which is the gradient, is constant. The answer is B. Know that graph, it comes up quite a bit. A uh, sample of Y, Young's modulus E. So you're tempted, I would be tempted straight away to say, well, E is stress over A, uh, stress over strain. So E equals, uh, there's, uh, you know, F over X, and then, um, you know, uh, it's FL over AX, isn't it? Yeah. But honestly, you don't need to. It's being a bit sneaky here. It's the same material. And if it's the same material, then <clears throat> it's the same as Young's modulus. It doesn't matter about the dimensions. If it's the same material, Young's modulus is a material property. The answer is B. Anyway, hope you found that useful. Uh, bye for now.